Hi, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. Everybody, I'm going to say a few welcoming words to you all. And, um, so, I want to welcome you to this show. Inspiration Katahdin, an, image, an, an exhibit of images and ideas. And it's celebrating the 50th anniversary of the publishing of my book, Greatest Mountain, Katahdin's Wilderness, in 1972. And the book was published by Scrimshaw Press. And, the, and it had a linen, linen bound hardcover and a soft cover. And interestingly enough, when it was designed, it was designed to become the book that it became in 1999 because the, the designer of the book, who was the man I was studying photography with out in uh, California, um, who was a great friend of Ansel Adams, and I uh, had studied with Ansel and, and uh, was assistant at a lot of Ansel's workshops back then. But he designed this book and he called it Greatest Mountain, Katahdin's Wilderness, as though it were alive, as though it had spirit. And, and in the front he put quotes by a uh, Wabanaki woman, and it, it said, every mountain, he got Injun in it, Katahdin, he man. Okay, so I didn't know, and then the, the back is Katahdin, he different, mountain once was man. And this was Clara Neptune in, uh, 1916 or something, I actually don't have that memorized. Um, but I didn't know there were any Indians in the state of Maine at the time. I grew up here. And my life led me to question the prevailing paradigm of what my, our people uh, walked in alignment with a paradigm that I felt had holes in it because my ancestors, the Baxters, and Percy Baxter, who gave this great mountain and 40 other mountains and 200,000 acres to the people of Maine to be held forever wild, he's not actually my ancestor. His father, James Finney Baxter, is my ancestor. And so um, <clears throat> this book, it was designed and then, well, okay, that's where I was going. I was going with the Baxter family of the giveaway, the great philanthropic giveaway to the people of Maine. And in office, they champion the women, the poor, the, um, the earth, the water, the animals. They were heart-based politicians who gave away their fortunes to the people of Maine. And this led me to question the paradigm. What were they aligning with? What, what reality did, did, were they connecting with? And I went in search of the missing pieces of the paradigm. And the answers you get depend on the questions you ask. Okay, and I went to Europe looking for these missing pieces, looking for another paradigm, and I found the same paradigm. I found the same thinking. And I came back to the United States and visionary elders started coming into my life in the uh, 90s in Aspen, Colorado. And I saw through them another reality. I saw through them what I got was the true nature of the universe. And from that time, I also saw that they had a key role to play in the future of humanity. And as this has unfolded, and I'm gonna speak a little later on that subject, so I won't go there extensively now. Um, but I saw the future, I see the future, I see big pictures, and I see the coming of peace on earth and heaven on earth. And the role of the native people in that as we come together with them, the scientific paradigm and the indigenous paradigm come together and we find a, a reality that's never been on the planet before. We are aligned with our hearts, our spirits, and we bring something on the planet that's never been here before. So that's been my life over 30 years. And in 1999, well, the book was republished in um, 1976 by Downey's Books, briefly. Um, <laughs> and in 1999,
And um, <coughs> then in 1999, as he, it was in the early 90s that I connected with the Native people. And I came to Maine, uh, actually it was for the, um, the internment of my uncle, uh, Hartley Baxter, whose son he is here today, um, Scott Baxter. And <coughs> on my way into Maine, I stopped at a little Indian uh, shop and I talked to the woman there. And you're going to meet her in the film I'm going to show. And it was Barbara Running Water uh, Beckwith. Running Water is her Indian name. And I said, you know, who would I, who could I meet? And she says, you have to talk to Ani Neptune. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so she told me how to get in touch with Arnie Neptune. Well, that began a love affair between Arnie Neptune and me, a, you know, a spiritual love affair. <laughs> and so Arnie is in his heart. Arnie was a visionary elder, and I call these folks visionary elders because they see the universality of humanity, and they, they're, they're willing to go into their heart and into the essence of the native way the native knowing, okay? And that is, is key for all of us to access that heart of the native people and, and, and their ways that have been passed down through the millennia. And so, um, so this book became a new book. It became the book that Dave Bohm, and you'll see a, some, a quote by Dave, encouraging me in my photography in 1970. Um, and uh, this book became the book that book was designed to be because it brought in the Native people. And Arnie wrote a piece for it, and um, a man, a producer of a film, wrote a piece for it um, on, the, on the Wabanaki connection to the Sacred Mountain. So, <clears throat> and those uh, are up here tonight. Um, in the show, so you can experience them. And the, show, the book is for sale. It's out of print. It's for sale um, over there. If you have Venmo, you can uh, do a little thing with your phone. And if not, uh, the lovely lady over there, Greta White, who's also a Baxter, um, will take your uh, money. So, uh, um, so that's that. Uh, let's see, what else was I going to say? I think I've said it all, actually. And I've said it in a good way. Um, I'm going to say some more stuff later. Um, let's see, okay. What I also am going to mention is Percy Baxter, climbing Katahdin. What I'm saying is he heard Katahdin. Katahdin is an, 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 it speaks, literally, to people who are open-hearted and open-minded, and, and most people say they see God when they go on this mountain. So I've been making a, a case for the mystical nature of Katahdin and, and my film series. We're gonna screen a film here next Wednesday called Katahdin Mystical Mountain. And um, I put that film together to make the case for the mystical vortex of energy that Katahdin is. And so Percy Baxter, when he, in his first climb of Katahdin, um, he, uh, what I'm saying is he, he heard this voice that said, hey, this is a sacred place. It needs to be preserved for all of time. And he responded to that. And as we do that, as we listen to our hearts and listen to the energies and act on that, we get, we're going to bring something new to the planet, okay? And he did with, with his, his action of 30 years of, um, it took him 30 years of negotiating with the Great Northern Paper Company to acquire Katahdin, the first piece in this tapestry of um, little bits and pieces that he put together. He called it a grandmother's quilt. And those quotes, and the book is um, full of quotes from Percy because I wanted people to understand his purpose, his vision, his heart, his spirit, that he didn't do it for tax purposes. You know, that, that this is a sacred gift that he gave to the people of Maine. And he gave it over 30 years in different deeds of trust so that it couldn't be broken. And he left um, $500,000 or more uh, uh, on his, uh, before he died 
because he didn't want it to be subject to main taxes and main decisions of government. So there's a, an authority that's set up um, of the fish and game, the attorney general, the forestry, and there's one other person. Um, so they administer the park. And um, he set it up to be like when the native people were roaming. He wanted it to be forever wild so that humanity could come in the right unspoiled way and be with nature in that way. So there's no electricity, there's no running water, there's no, uh, there's only single lane dirt roads. So he kept it in the rhythms of creation, in the rhythms of life. And uh, I spent a lot of time at the Hopi Indian Reservation and they live like that. There's only a few left who live without running water and without electricity. But they, they've made that point for humanity to do that. And he did that here with this park. So it's just important that everyone understand how, how he, his vision, and that's what, what the book is about, basically, um, so, that, so that they don't try to break the trust. They don't try to, um, to violate the, uh, these principles, these universal principles of life, okay? So um, the other thing I wanted to bring up was um, Henry David Thoreau, okay? He climbed Katahdin. He came several times to Maine, three times to Maine, and hired Indian guides so that he could learn their ways. He saw that they could see what he could see, okay? Got that? He was a mystic. He saw it. He knew it. He came and said, okay, what was it? He was one of the top ethnologists of his time. He wrote uh, uh, journals um, uh, and notebooks on his research on the native people, what they were like before contact. And then he came up here <clears throat> to experience them. He also went to Minnesota to experience them. Um, but he came and experienced them here. And so I just wanted to, to bring that into your knowledge. I, I'm seeing friends here and I'm getting distracted. Um, <laughs> um, <clears throat> so he climbed Katahdin. He had an epiphany on Katahdin. Okay, huge. You know, some people say, oh, he just, he just went nuts. Okay, but he had a major epiphany. And um, that's in um, one of the quotes over there. So you can read it. Uh, it starts, contact, contact, who am I, where am I? What's it all about? Uh, that's not literal, but. Um, so it, you'll, you'll see it there. And so I wanted to bring him in. And I also wanted to, um, bring in the, the Wabanaki, which I've done, and you'll be seeing them shortly. I'll give you some time to get up and walk around and be together, and then we'll show the film. It's 10 minutes. It's, um, it's excerpts from the Mystical Mountain um, video that's, that's 45 minutes long. I just took out Barbara, Be Barbara Running Water and Arnie Neptune on the spiritual connection to this mountain of the Wabanaki. So it's, it's very important what you'll learn from these people because it's a different reality. Um, many of you may have had mystical experiences, but it's, it's, it's a, a, that you may not even tell anybody about, okay? Um, so uh, anyway, you'll learn what these people from their hearts, how they experience this mountain. And um, I also just wanted to mention that <clears throat> uh, several Wednesday nights, we're, I'm going to be screening uh, um, different films from my film series, The American Evolution, Voices of America, that I put together in 2002. Uh, at, uh, this show was in Concord, Massachusetts in 2002, exactly 20 years ago, this July. Mm -hmm. And at that show, Arnie Neptune, Barbara Beckwith, and a um, uh, Thoreau impersonator and a Thoreau scholar all showed up and I filmed it and I made a five-part film series on civil disobedience, on the mystical nature of the universe, of, of, of very important stuff for uh, walking this path to the future of humanity as we live in balance and understand the oneness 
and sacredness of all life. So, um, so we're going to be doing that, and there's a list on the um, on the cards of the evenings that we're going to be doing that through July and August, and then on on August 20th, we're doing a a, th a performance piece that I put together um, for uh, it premiered at the Thoreau Society uh, of Henry David Thoreau and Joe Polis, his Indian guide and hero, sitting around the campfire after a long day's paddle up the Allagash. And the, what it's called, it's called Thoreau, the Futurist and the Emerging Human, wow. AKA Thoreau and Joe. Okay, so this is Thoreau's vision of the future of humanity and the role of indigenous people in that. Okay, and they're all direct quotes from Henry David Thoreau. I was given a compendium of every reference he ever made to the Native Americans in all his writings. And I put that together for this piece because for me, what's important is the future of humanity and how to, how to get to peace on earth and bring heaven to earth. And uh, there are very many clues in Henry David. I use people like Thoreau and Einstein and Arnie Neptune and Katahdin uh, to make the case for an expanded reality. And so that we can, people can just get ideas that resonate to their hearts and let, let that heart open so that we can walk in alignment with our hearts. And now the new science, the only other thing I'm gonna mention is the new physics. And we're very involved with this field of consciousness, the leap in consciousness. And the new physics, I don't know if any of you are aware, but physics has gone beyond quantum physics. Quantum physics actually explains what the native people know about the nature of the universe. Okay, and, and we, Andrew and I have written a book called The Trust Frequency, 10 Assumptions for a New Paradigm, which is a synthesis of indigenous cosmology and quantum science for bringing tools for walking in alignment with universal law and the abundance and love that is all things. And so um, the new physics, the unified physics, Resonance Science, Resonance Science Academy. You can go online and take a free course if you're curious um, to, uh, to learn about this stuff. But it's being proven that we are the universe, okay? I mean, the plank, the tiniest, 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 tiniest thing is the same as the biggest, 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 biggest thing. It's fractal, it's, it's holographic. And our emotions, our heart, our actions, our thoughts, everything we do affects the cosmos. And they're proving this. Okay, there are people who know this that don't need science to prove it. Okay, they laugh. And I say, oh, science is proving it now. It's really exciting. And they go, ah, of course. <laughs> who needs to prove it? Right? So there are people who know this stuff. And it just hasn't been au courant or okay to uh, express it and live it and be it. But that time's coming. The time is here with the, with the breakdown of everything. It's really exciting because we're, we're, we're doing the deal. We're letting go of what wasn't aligned with universal law and what is coming is a world in alignment with universal law and the abundance and love that is all things. So trust, it, trust your feelings, Luke and Lucretia. And that's what I told my kids, my girls, trust your feelings, Lucretia, and trust your feelings, Luke. I assume you all know what that means. Who said that? Obi-Wan Kenobi, right? <laughs> come on, kids. Come on, come on, come on, come on. <laughs> um, so that's it for now. And then I'm going to do it again a little, little different, a um, little later. <laughs> OK? So enjoy. Listen up. It's all right here. Yeah. And that's what Wallace Blackout said to me. 1999, one of the great Lakota elders. He said, this is the mind. And they're proving that now. Heartmath.org. I don't know if you know Heartmath. But they're proving the power of the heart. And uh, that, it, that it has a field and a, and, a, and a power that's bigger than our, this mind. So, 
Anywho, <laughs> enjoy. And give us your, give me your email. Put your email, and I'll send you links to our other films. And there's another book over there called The Mayflower Revelations that Andrew wrote, because the Pilgrims and Indians lived in peace and friendship for 54 years, and at the founding of this nation, and were spiritually aligned. And this is a very big deal for this nation. And um, I'll, I'll speak to that a bit. But I just, since you're I have a captive audience, and you may all eat and leave. Um, uh, you know, like the panda eats, shoots, and leaves, right? Uh, uh, anyway, yeah, what was I saying? Oh, the Pilgrims and Indians. So Andrew's book, it's a novel. It's a, it's a historical mystery novel. It's really cool. And it, it's, it's been reviewed by the top Pilgrim scholar. So it's, it's, it's historically totally accurate and tells a new story that we lived in peace and friendship and that the pilgrims were spiritual activists that stood up to the King of England and came to this nation with the belief that we could, in fact, get there. We could, in fact, align with our hearts and live according to our conscience, which Henry David Thoreau said in Civil Disobedience. That was his point with Civil Disobedience. So it's all a tapestry that we've been weaving for decades. And um, if you give me your email, I'll send you some links and you can explore it all. So there, have fun. <laughs>